But what happens if you don't get that money? You need to have a relationship with a bank, a person in a bank. You start that relationship by going in and say, hello, this is me. You don't even have to bank there. You just need to be able to have someone who is going to take you from point A to point B. When I first started my business, first year, I couldn't, I couldn't borrow anything. And I started a relationship with a banker, and by my third year, I had a line of credit, which I shouldn't have used. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and a lot of, I, mean, I had everything that I needed. I wasn't really any more powerful as a business owner in my third year than I was in my first. But I had a relationship with a banker who guided me along and then was my advocate when I went into the bank. I mean, it, it's, it's that what, that we're trying to do. It's the same relationship with the procurement officer and the um, BOSS person. It's that person knowing you, knowing your business, having an affinity for you, and then being able to advocate for you when you're not in the room. That's what relationships are all about. But in addition to that, at, the, at our level, we also have to start bringing in technical personnel. We have to bring in that attorney that Ralph talked about so that we can make sure that we're doing things correctly. We have to bring in the accountants and the insurance agents so we make sure we have that team. And I'm not talking about paying a lot of money for all of this. I'm talking about having a resource team that you can talk with about your business and they're disinterested enough in your business that they can give you cogent advice. So it's not any attorney, it's not any accountant, it's those professionals who know your industry and also know how to get you from point A to point B. But you need to have those resources. One of the things that I found out when I joined um, organizations like the uh, Institute of Management Accountants is how smart I wasn't. Because now I'm dealing with financial executives that are dealing with Fortune 500 companies. A whole different set of problems, a whole different set of financial metrics, a whole, I mean, just a whole different world that in the small business community we're not exposed to. Once I became exposed to that and started to learn and study that, I began to see how we could take those concepts, turn them into English, and bring them to bear on where we are. They're not magic. Those concepts are not magic. We just don't have the resources to think about them. And when they talk about stock maximization, I mean, that has, that, you know, if we're in a stock market, that may mean something to us, but it has no relationship to my business. I mean, I have equity in a business. I might even have stock certificates in the business. But there's no relationship with stock maximization when we're talking. But essentially, that's the next level. We have to bring value to our equity inside of our company. But before we can even do that, we have to be able to make sure that we're getting value from it, OK? And so that's really, really important that we begin to think about that. So one more thing, please. Yeah, and that's extremely important. Thank you, Leroy. Teams. Teams are people who come together, exchange points of views, exchange differences, but they ex do that for your value. They do that for your value. And so if you don't have a board, I'm not necessarily saying that you need one at this point in time. That should be your goal to have a board, but you may not necessarily need one at this point in time. If you don't have a management team, you may not need one at this point in time. But you need to begin to start to bring together the professionals that you trust in building these relationships so that they can have a discussion with you as the focus of that discussion. Okay? When I, as a CFO, join a client's team, I actually become a member of their management team. I am an integral part of the discussion, and my job is to advise the CEO on how to make that company uh, value. And so teams are extremely important. Let's talk for a second about why this whole discussion about the first level and personal wealth is important. Because really it's about how do we get to the second level or the next level, which most of us will not get to. I hate to say that. But we can, but we won't. 
that next level is where we have the business develop our wealth as the business owners, the equity, and where the business itself, the business itself has its own wealth separate and distinct from our wealth as business owners. Now, that's a big thought because again, now we're talking about larger businesses where the stockholders, management team, board of directors all have their jobs and they're thinking individually about what they're supposed to do. We are probably all of those and as we grow we might have a management team but we probably won't have a, a stockholder meeting and all those other kinds of things. So our ability to then transition from personal wealth to business wealth is what the next level is all about. Making sure that at some point in time our business has enough value in it that it becomes attractive to a disinterested third party. Whether that third party is an investor, whether that third party wants to buy, whether that third party wants to merge, whatever happens, but you don't have the ability to do succession planning unless you have something of value that someone else finds attractive. Would, would you agree? I've got a really good business, it's taking care of me, that's fine. I'm at the point where I want to get out. How do I get out? I walk away? <laughs> that's not the plan. So then someone's got to have interest in it. What's your name, my friend? Linus. Linus. I want Linus to buy it. He wants to buy it. But there has to be some value in it for Linus. Am I right? You have to see some value. Not, no, not only on the financials, but you have to see some value in the company. I want to merge with Petrina, right? And Petrina and I want to merge. But she's not going to merge with me unless there's some value there. I'm not going to merge with her unless I can see some value in her company. We have to begin to realize that at some point in time, we're going to want to have someone outside of our company, third party, look at our company, and we want that company to be attractive to it. And so it has to have value. And I contend that that is what we call stockholder wealth. And why do I call it stockholder wealth? Because while we are the business owners, we have to separate ourselves from the business owners and become stockholders because that's essentially what we are. We're a combination of all of those things at the small and medium-sized business level, but at the large level, they're separate, and we have to begin to separate ourselves. I'll give you a couple examples. Over the last, I say, three years, we've been doing maybe two or three M&As a year in our client base, and that's because our clients are getting older like we are, and we're really transitioning. The good thing about it is that we began to have discussions about building value five, ten years ago. And so when we do an M&A, there are loads and loads of financials involved, there are loads and loads of documentation involved. But there, what I call the courting period, there are probably five, six, or seven companies that want to look at your company before you even get to the discussion table. And each one of those companies is looking to see what's in the company, the target company, for them. Each one of them. And so if your company doesn't have any value, you're not even going to get to the courtesy shopping stage. And if your company doesn't have any value, there's not going to be a succession plan. And if there's no succession plan, then you have to be concerned about where your income is going to uh, come from after you get through your rainmaker years, okay? Rainmaker years, in my mind, is when you're generating income. That's essentially what we're all doing right now, okay? If you were an employee, those would be earning years. But we're not employees. We're the ones who make sure employees are paid. So that's rainmaker years. And so here's what I'm saying. During the period when you have the ability to generate income through revenue, that is the exact same period that you should be using to make sure that your financial security, independence, and wealth are taken care of. Really, I wish I would have joined the uh, Institute of Management Accountants a long time ago because I wasted a lot of time, believe me. But when you don't have the ability to generate income, when you don't have the ability to control your earnings, that's when the accumulation of all of that wealth is going to become vital to you because that becomes your income. If you don't do it during that period, 30 years, 40 years, or whatever it happens to be, you're going to spend the next 20, 25, 30 years 
in real dire trouble. Um, think Social Security. Social Security is kin to public assistance. Um, none of us want to be there, right? So we have to start now to think about our businesses totally differently. And if we think about them as economic assets that can provide the financial security and independence that we need, that's a start. That's the mindset I would like all of us to um, at least begin to think about before we uh, leave today. OK? Mindset. Great. Second thing. First thing, business plan. We agree with that? OK, good. And pop quiz. The three things that we want from our business, the first level. Anybody know? You can read. <laughs> right. I like, what's your name, young man? Al. Al? Al. Al's got him. Living, personal living, personal financial security, personal independence, which will lead to personal business owner wealth at the next level. Thank you, Al. Those are things we absolutely need. And Al looks like he's already on personal independence. So, you know, he, you know he, he's, he's cool. That's what I'm, so let's all talk to Al. We, we definitely need to be on his side. OK, business plan, resources. Now, very, very important that we begin to understand that finances drives this entire mechanism. Not only finances, cash flow drives this entire mechanism. One of the things that we do, and we do this as accountants, in our early years, we try to minimize taxes any way we possibly can. But unfortunately, we keep that mindset throughout our growth. Uncle Sam, we don't want to give him a cent. The state, we don't want to give him a cent. That's our mantra. And you hire people like me to make sure that happens. The fallacy in that is if you don't pay Uncle Sam, you can't use any of that money for yourself. You can't. And so I need you to begin to think about taxes as a toll on the road to success. In the early years, let's plan to minimize it. In all the other years, let's plan to minimize it. But second to minimizing income taxes is maximizing cash. And sometimes the two of those things don't match. Let me give you an example. Performance indicators. When Ralph was here, he talked about current assets. Current assets is a performance indicator. It tells us what our debt to uh, asset ratio is, and it's very important to banks. Performance indicators are also important. What's a performance indicator? Um, if you look at your gross profit, and I don't want to get into too many numbers here, but if you look at your gross profit, that's your income less what it costs you to make that income. Okay? So let's say you have $10 of income, and it costs you $8 to make that $10. That means you have $2 left over. That's an indicator. That tells you how much you are putting towards making the revenue and how much you have left over to support the rest of your company. Very important number. In my mind, that's a more important number than the net profit because the net profit is after everything is spent and you have control of everything below that gross profit to some, some extent. You may not have full control over the cost of sales because that's what you have to do in order to get your product out. You know, you, there's some control there, but essentially that's what I'm talking about. And so what do you do? Instead of just looking at your financial statement, you go and you look at your industry and you find out what kind of performance is happening with other companies in your industry. And you use those indicators as your benchmarks for your performance. So let's use a, an example. Let's just say we're looking at Safe Solutions event planners and event planners have a 20% gross profit and a 5% net profit in the industry overall. When we put together the financials for Safe Solutions, those are going to be our goals. Our budget's going to come out with a 20% gross profit. Our budget's going to come out with a 5% net profit. And during the year, we're going to monitor to make sure we get as close to those numbers as possible. And why is that? Because we want to take that gross profit and make it smaller. We want to pay less money for the money we're bringing in. And we want that net profit to be higher. We want to retain more money than we're doing. And what happens when we retain more money? Yes, we pay more income taxes. True. 
But once you pay Uncle Sam his 25%, 30%, that still leaves you 70% of that money that is now yours. Again, the cost of doing business is the toll along the road. Now, people say, well, big businesses don't pay any taxes. True. There are a lot of them that do not because they're able to take advantage of all of the tax loopholes that exist. Now, trust me, as a tax accountant, when a new loophole comes out, I sit down and we try and figure out how to apply it to as many <laughs> companies as possible. But most of those loopholes take cash flow to implement. And we don't have the cash flow. And so you can't have your cake and eat it too. So please. Mm -hmm. Coming from a small business standpoint, mm -hmm. Uh -huh, sure does, sure does. So primarily, your first responsibility is to take care of those business taxes. And if you're um, a C corporation, that means that the entity itself pays income tax. Okay. okay. If you decide to make an election, and it's tax election that IRS, that you make with IRS to become an S corporation, the corporation doesn't pay taxes. It filters down to your personal return under the assumption that your personal tax rate will be lower than the corporate tax rate. May or may not be. And then the sole proprietor um, is where your business is on your personal return. And that may or may not be a good thing, uh, depending upon the facts and circumstances. And then they have other things called pass-through entities, partnerships, LLCs. Again, where the entity itself doesn't pay taxes, it filters down to your personal return. There are advantages and disadvantages to each one of them. But to answer your question, you start worrying about business taxes first, and then you worry about how to generate how to minimize your personal taxes. You start at the level where the revenue is coming, and then you worry about the distributions to yourself. Okay. And using that as an example, that's why when you do your taxes, you're not looking to wash out all of your income. Trust me, if you don't have any money in the bank, Uncle Sam doesn't care. You're the one who should care. You've got to care that there's no money in the bank. Having a, a net loss on a tax return might be wonderful for not having to pay Uncle Sam anything, but what I don't want is that it reflects that we don't have any cash flow. I want you to have cash flow. I want you to have sufficient cash flow that if you do have a tax responsibility, we can take care of that and we can take the rest of that money and put it to your executive benefits, which may or may not be tax deductible, but still, they're your executive benefits, your retirement plan, your key person life insurance, your succession planning, all those things that you're not doing for yourself and won't do for yourself because you can't afford it. My job is to make you have the cash flow to afford it. And along that is paying Uncle Sam his portion of it. So I'm not saying pay Uncle Sam taxes that he shouldn't have. Yes, let's plan to get them down as low as possible. You can even have a net profit and take advantage of special things like accelerate depreciation that wipe that profit out. What I don't want you to do is not have any money, and because you don't have any money, you don't have any tax responsibility. That's not the way to get to, get to where we need to go. We need to make sure that we have cash flow, and having that cash flow automatically means that there's something that we've got to pay for, and it's, it's just like a toll. You've got to pay the toll in order to use the bridge, that bridge is cash flow. Leroy? Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, Marvin and Leroy will tell you, if you submit financials to them, and there's no progression of uh, profitability, they, there's nothing they can argue. They can't advocate for that. And that's why you build that relationship early with them. Take those financials, show it to them. They'll look at it. You've got, got software that will analyze financials, profit and losses, and balance sheets. I mean, they'll stick it in their software. They'll come up with all kinds of wonderful metrics that uh, I don't even want to talk about. But then they'll be able to tell you exactly what you need to do to be bankable. 
is the exact same thing that we're going to do. Um, essentially, we use the same basic concepts, and that concept has to be that if you don't have any money, you're not getting any money. Bottom line, okay? Which, but which will eventually affect your growth potential for the future. It goes back to your business plan. Exactly, exactly. So it's a one circle. So cash flow. Cash flow has got to be it because cash flow is what's going to provide me, the owner, with the living wage. Come on, you can do better than that. Secondly, personal financial security. And thirdly, what? Financial independence, right? Uh, you, you guys got it really well. Got, got, that, got every single one of them right. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's cash flow. Now, I really want you to understand that cash flow just doesn't happen. You have to have the ability to take your accounting and turn those numbers into something that means something and have meaning. We talked earlier. When you first start out, you may not need an, uh, a full accounting firm. You may just need a bookkeeper. And as you start to grow, you go into an accountant. And as you get into the, the uh, areas where you need assurances, you become getting an auditing CPA firm. Um, if taxes are your forte, you get a tax manager. But as you grow, the question becomes, does that financial professional have the ability to translate what's on paper into reality? Can that, that financial professional take that profit and loss and balance sheet, explain it to you, because it's yours, okay? Explain it to you and also make it so that you know how to make those financials work for you. Performance indicators, metrics, building cash flow. How do you take this, 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 these numbers that you paid for, you paid for somebody to debit and credit and made it look really nice on a financial statement, they give it to you, you put it away, things keep going on. No, you've got to be able to take those financials and make them real for you. You've got to be able to do that because without the proper financials, there's no ability to plan. Without the ability to plan, there's no way you're going to generate sufficient cash flow. And without sufficient cash flow, there's no way we're going to meet those minimum three criteria of the first level. And I again say they are wages. All right. Whew. Right. One, <laughs> two. All right. And three. Oh, man, do I love this group of one. Yes, absolutely. We've got to do that. Please, Judy. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, limit of the amount of wages that you're doing it yourself to find bookkeepers in today's world? Do you know of any companies online or, um, or, or any, any, because uh, most of the time, big firms have bookkeeping services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are. So first of all, you need to have a, um, a simple business plan, a, a business accounting software. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, QuickBooks is probably the best known, and it's probably one of the least expensive. If you contact um, uh, professional groups or county groups, um, at Montgomery County, the Vance has a list of mentors program, people who have gone through the mentorship program who are accountants and bookkeepers who are just starting out. The most important thing is that you need to figure out whether or not that bookkeeper understands your business and understands how to make you understand that business. Because early on, you probably can keep the books yourself once you're shown. It should be set up by a financial professional, the chart of accounts and other technical things. If you want to learn it yourself, and you should, I contend that your financials, you should know them. You may not want to do it, but there's your financials, you should know them. One of the things that we do with all of our clients, whether they like it or not, kicking and screaming, we sit down and we go through every major metrics on the financials, profit and loss, balance sheet, statement of cash flow, and business planning. And why is it? Because it's not mine. <laughs> it's not mine. It belongs to that client. And that client has to be able to buy into it. And then that client has to be able to see the value in those numbers and putting those numbers together, OK? So um, yeah, there are associations. If you need a bookkeeper, give me a call, okay? 
we'll get you a bookkeeper, and it depends on the price point and other things. But everyone should at least have a bookkeeper uh, that takes care of their accounting. And the two things that I want to say before we leave that point is, is that it's recording the transactions correctly, and it's reconciling those cash and bank accounts. You need, if you don't know anything else, you need to know every day how much money you have in your bank and how that's being used. Even if you just go online and check it, cash, I'm sorry, is king. And the smaller we are, the more vital cash becomes. And the larger we grow, the more vital it becomes to accumulate cash. And it all comes from cash flow, which means that you can't spend every dime that comes into your business. You can't. You can't. And one of the things that we like to ask our clients to do is when deposits go into the bank, take 10% of those deposits and move it in some type of reserve account. You can't spend every dime that comes into your business. And if you never start moving money to a reserve account, you'll never build up a capital reserve. Sure, something will happen and you use it and you move it back in, but at least you have it. We have to get into the mind frame of doing things for ourselves that are going to better the financial position of our company. And so take 10% of your deposits, move them over every month, begin to capitalize yourself, but also begin to realize that now, while we don't want to pay Uncle Sam anything, in order to get the benefits we need, we have to consider income taxes the same as we would rent. You have to have an office. You have to have Uncle Sam. You have to, you, you have to consider Uncle Sam a toll. We'll get him down as, as much as we possibly can, but the cash flow is what we're more interested in, OK? Good. We talked about peers. We talked about um, relationships. And again, one of the things that was extremely important to me was SBA when I first started, Montgomery County government. The Vance was the first, and they talked about it very briefly in the introduction. He has a mentorship program. Started in 1991, right? Uh, I was in the very first class. It's when they take new businesses and they put them with seasoned businesses and the seasoned business teaches you what you need to know. So Vance asked me as a new business, what did I need to know? And I told him, contracts. He paired me with a large law firm. Thank you very much. And from that law firm, they taught me contracts. And I had nothing to do with accounting. I was, I was trying to learn how to run a business. Um, since then, we've been mentors in that program, national program. Ralph has a program, Mentor Protege Program. When Ralph showed you that big circle and that green part, all of the big businesses who are making all of the money <laughs> and all of the contracts for SBA, those businesses take smaller businesses and they take them under their wing and they help them to grow. Mentor protege programs. Those are the kinds of things that we want to be involved with. We can't know everything, and in order for us to know more, we have to align ourselves with different kinds of people. I call it a resource group. We have to align ourselves with different kinds of people. The discussion we're having today about making sure our business is an economic asset wouldn't have happened 15 years ago because I had not aligned myself with the people who think and live and run their companies on this basis. They're extremely successful. Why can't we be extremely successful? There's no reason why we can't be extremely successful, except we don't have the exposure to the information. We don't have access to the professional and relationships that are there. And we don't have the time to implement it. And so today, we can get rid of two of those things. We have the exposure. We have the access. Work on your time. You can definitely make sure that we're in good shape. Now, two things I want to leave you with. One. This is extremely important. So I need you to understand one more thing, that in your business, you should be looking now to make sure the business is providing the benefits inside of the entity that you need.